Well, my father was an immigrant from the Ukraine back in 1922, and he was only 12 years old when he came over, and he worked with a brother in a tiny town in Mississippi until he was old enough to go into a small little business of his own in a town named Baldwin, Mississippi. That's spelled B-A-L-D-W-Y-N and not like the piano. Um, <clears throat> and this was um, a wonderful, very small community of about 2,000 people. Uh, we were the only Jewish family in this community. Um, and so that was a little bit of an unusual kind of mix for this community to welcome in a, a Jewish family. Uh, and it was a wonderful group of people. Of course, the community was completely segregated at that time. This was in 1933. Uh, and uh, my father was just a fantastic person. He worked all the time uh, and trying to get his little business started. It was the height of the Depression in the South. Uh, and uh, no one really had any money. Everything essentially was bartered. There was this whole series of barns in back of his little store where they had livestock for bartering. And my mother wasn't able to really participate very much in my upbringing, but I had the incredibly good fortune of having two, an African-American lady and an African-American gentleman who were in some ways my auxiliary parents. And they, in so many ways, they had no opportunity for education, neither did my father, who had no opportunity for any education. But they possessed a kind of a wisdom and kindness that was really something that a child needed at that time. And so that really allowed me to sort of manage in this community where there were very few other kind of resources uh, uh, of any kind, uh, uh, any, certainly from an intellectual point of view. But it sort of gave you a sort of grounding of sort of human nature and what some of the trials and tribulations are. And I, you know, experienced firsthand the kind of difficulties my African-American sort of auxiliary parents had. And fortunately, this part of Mississippi, this northeast part, was not the terrible part of Mississippi that has such a terrible history. It, it didn't have the violence that went on in so, much, uh, so many other parts of the state. And so that was good. Um, but I sort of grew up uh, in this whole place. Actually, uh, I was born in a town <clears throat> adjacent, uh, just a few miles away, Tupelo, Mississippi, which uh, has the fame of two weeks later giving birth to Elvis Presley. So Elvis Presley and I were born within two weeks in Tupelo, Mississippi, and there are a lot of Elvis stories. We don't have time really to go into all of them now, but there are many of them. So you may have rubbed shoulders at some point? Well, we didn't rub shoulders, but it almost seemed like we did because there's so many stories. And in fact, even uh, in the last several years, there's a hardware store in Tupelo that if you walk in, the first thing they ask you is if you want to hear the Elvis story. And then they say, of course you do. And they tell you the Elvis story of how he got his first guitar in Tupelo. And this is something that my children had experienced and told me, well, you have to go to this Tupelo hardware and listen to this story. So I felt like I actually kind of knew Elvis, uh, even though I'd never formally met him. Well, he used a guitar to get out of Mississippi. Absolutely. Um, you used something else. And, and when did you start to think that college may be an opportunity for you and even pre-med? Well, I grew up next door to a general practitioner. Um, and uh, I really became very close to him. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> it was probably the thing that kind of introduced me into medicine. Really, there weren't that many different opportunities I really spent much of my life, I participated in everything in school. There were only 29 people in my graduating class. I was on the football team, the basketball team. I really wasn't very good, but you didn't have to be very good. All you had to do was show up. And I did that and I you know, spent a lot of evenings in the pool hall or whatever. There weren't terribly uh, you know, numbers of opportunities to sort of 
go to libraries, or there were no libraries. Uh, and actually, uh, I'd never been to Nashville before, but I knew one person who had gone to Vanderbilt. So uh, it seemed like a reasonable. No one in my school had ever been out of state to college. And so I thought, well, why don't we give this a try? You know, I listened to the grand old opera on Saturday nights. Maybe Nashville would be a good place to go. So um, we, my parents took me to Nashville for the first time and sort of introduced me to a uh, <coughs> college um, dorm. And there I was. And so now I find myself moved from this small town to a totally different kind of environment that was rather difficult because I'd never experienced either the intellectual uh, sort of challenge that I was going to face or any uh, of the challenges that I was going to face. It was a difficult period for me. But fortunately, uh, during that period, I met a young woman, a beautiful young woman, who was then uh, going to become my wife, my wife Vivian. Now we're actually celebrating our 60th wedding anniversary this year. We were married in, in Nashville, and she's the love of my life, and it's been all kind of a we history. It's not really a me history. It's been something that we've done together since that time. So we, uh, <clears throat> we uh, were there until in, in Nashville, and she worked in teaching school, and I finished medical school. In fact, <clears throat> my father came to Nashville, my two uh, sons, I'll, I'll tell you about in a minute, uh, graduated from Vanderbilt Medical School, as did I, and Vivian and I graduated from undergrad. My father said, you know, he says, I've never been to school at all, and I've been to five Vanderbilt graduations. I said, well, I said, you know, the fact is that you made all this possible. And so, which, which was really the, the truth. So, uh, so undergrad was difficult. I guess. Undergraduate was extremely difficult for me because I didn't rapidly learn how to adjust to a new kind of environment. Everything had been so easy uh, for me in this small school because there was really intellectually no challenge at all. And now all of a sudden I was up against this sort of uh, <clears throat> a wall or this challenge of, of educating. And I knew I wanted to go to medical school, uh, but it was, looked like it was going to be hopeless. Uh, but the reality is, is that I was the last person accepted into my medical school class of 50. There were only 50 students at Vanderbilt. And basically what happened then is that medical school became much easier for me. I actually graduated in the upper 10% of my class and was able actually then to sort of choose a further residency program, which uh, ended us up at Yale. Uh, and that was, again, a totally other kind of experience. But we, uh, Vivian and I, had a great time in Nashville, and, uh, <clears throat> and um, we were ready to sort of take on a new venture uh, after that. Had you started thinking about scientific research at that point while you were still at Vanderbilt? Well, I was exposed to some really uh, incredible people. Grant Little, for instance, who was one of the <clears throat> probably foremost figures in endocrinology even today, uh, was had come from NIH, actually, just a couple of years before I was a junior medical student. David Rogers had come from Cornell. He was chairman of the Department of Medicine. And so there was some really uh, uh, seminal people uh, on the faculty at Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt was and is one of the outstanding medical schools in the country without any question. And uh, so it, 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 it was really a true experience and I was just totally immersed. I loved it. I, you know, worked very hard but I just loved it. And I was, you know, had on my little white coat and was started to see patients and that was very exciting, you know, to come out of the sort of basic science into now clinical medicine. 
In fact, even the wards at Vanderbilt when I was a student were still segregated. And it was only uh, the, the schools, actually, by the time we left Nashville, were beginning for the first time to integrate. So now you could see this community, which was pulling together in a very, uh, in a very, very important way, and was really in the sort of uh, forefront of a more sane form of desegregation. I mean, because you know this history in the South really is such a terrible history uh, of segregation, and and now you're beginning to see those things kind of come down and it began to open up. Obviously it didn't happen all of a sudden as, as we well know, but, but it did happen and uh, that's everything else is, is far better uh, that it's happened. Had you done any research at all um, at, at Vanderbilt? Uh, I had worked to some extent during uh, uh, <clears throat> sort of more library type research with a, a neurologist uh, who was uh, uh, Dr. Bert Sprofkin, who was a neurologist who I'd uh, gotten to be very close to as a medical student and I had done some research with him but it was more of a library type of research. I really hadn't participated in any kind of either basic or clinical research but uh, uh, since it was since people like Little and Rogers were really very important clinical investigators, those things kind of rubbed off. You sort of realized uh, that there were people who were real mentors, and you began to understand to some extent what mentorship is. So not only were you learning just the basics, but you were learning something about the process in which we all sort of hand off to the next, you know, the next group from people who were really that good. Yale was an incredible new experience for Vivian and I. We, um, you know, we had never been out of the South. Uh, we really were exposed to a much more cosmopolitan. We were very close to New York. We could go in to see plays. We could do things we had never done before. And fortunately, it was really a, a, a very defining experience for both of us. I worked very hard. We worked every other night. But every minute we had off, we were always doing something. And again, we were exposed to an extraordinary group of people. Uh, both those people who were my sort of peers, but also the faculty. Uh, there was Paul Beeson, who was the kind of one of the legendary chairmen of medicine, who decided he had to go to England uh, because she couldn't practice uh, medicine anymore in the United States because all they wanted you to do was raise money as a chairman, and the only way he could really practice medicine would be to go to England. And in fact, I was supposed to go with him. I was uh, my first uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, mentor as a fellow uh, was Tom Ferris, who uh, went with Beeson to help set up the program. It turns out that my draft board decided that I wasn't going to leave the country, so I didn't have that opportunity at the time. Where was the program going to be? At, at Oxford. Okay. Uh, he was, uh, Beeson went as a professor at Oxford. and. Uh, Tom Ferris went with him, he came back, and he was in chairman of the Department of Medicine at uh, University of Minnesota. And this was part of this vigorous environment, Phil Bondi, Frank Epstein, who later became chairman of medicine at, uh, <clears throat> uh, at Beth Israel in Boston, uh, and just a whole host of other people. But the, the environment that we sort of found ourselves in was just totally different than our experience uh, in the South. And we loved it. Uh, we sort of, again, both of us worked very hard. Vivian was teaching school again, and uh, our <clears throat> oldest son was born uh, in, um, in New Haven. Um, we lived in a, sort of the upstairs of a doctor's office at that time and had some very other very close friends who were in a sort of similar sort of situation. Research really uh, was sort of all around me at Yale, and uh, I uh, uh, did three years of residency, 
And then I began a fellowship, an NIH-sponsored fellowship, in what was called metabolism, which was the sort of legacy of John Peters, who was this sort of legendary uh, person that a number of people in the renal area uh, had worked with, uh, who were people who were here at NIH and people who had been chairmen of medicine all over the country. Uh, and uh, Epstein was part of that, Bondi was part of that. These were all part of this sort of intellectual core. And so Tom Ferris was just a new investigator, and I said, well, I'd like to work with you. And um, that sort of got me started. And in fact, uh, I was able to present a paper at the most important medical meeting that was always held in Atlantic City. And uh, out of the work that we did over the first couple of years, so somehow the, the fire was, was being Kindle there for research, and it was it was at the very early days. But Tom Ferris and I had already published several papers, and actually we had published several papers just based on my residency experience of some novel patients we were seeing at the time. And so the the the, the experience of sort of doing research or exposed to research or how people talk about research was being sort of kindled during that period of time. And um, so we, we spent five terrific years at, uh, at Yale and then um, there was sort of the next chapter, time to do something different. There was the draft board to deal with. There was the draft board to how deal with. How did you work that out? Well, I did uh, at a, in a little bit different way what so many people were doing at the time. Uh, I managed uh, to get a commission in the U.S. Public Health Service. And that then permitted me to go to a public health service facility. Uh, Jesse Roth, who had been here for the past th for th three previous years, uh, had a uh, research group and he was just kind of getting started himself. He had worked with the legendary uh, Yalo and Burson, uh, Yalo who won the Nobel Prize later for the development of radio aminoassay. And so he was starting a group and he was collaborating with someone named Ira Paston who's still here at the NIH, very distinguished uh, scientist, and they were working on a concept. But Jesse needed someone with some clinical experience. And I seemed to fit that bill. I certainly had more clinical experience than anybody who was here at, the, at that time. This was in 1966. So I came down and I said, well, this is terrific. I said, if we could sort of work all this out. So it, it was a little bit of a logistical issue, but it all worked itself out. And I came and I was somewhat of a mentor to a rather unusual group of people. A mentor in the sense that I was a person who actually knew more clinical medicine than they do, even though they were much brighter and certainly much more established individuals, or certainly would be. Uh, <clears throat> and the challenge at that time was to establish a clinical service. So Jesse and Ira Paston were working on a concept of how hormones worked, so-called polypeptide hormones. And they hypothesized that, that hormones work by binding to the surface of cells. And this was a totally novel concept at the time. And they uh, 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 were joined by, in 1968, by Bob Lefkowitz, uh, <clears throat> who was a fellow with the two of them. So the three of them really developed this concept of cell surface binding uh, of a hormone. And this was a whole new idea of how insulin or all the pituitary hormones worked. Now just uh, upstairs was Martin Rodbell who later would win the Nobel Prize for discovering the so-called G protein. So there was this incredible ferment uh, of things that were going on just at the same time. Now, also in 1968, 
we had these journal clubs uh, in these tiny little rooms with these incredibly heated projectors, these, these big lantern slide projectors, and you'd sort of, everybody was smoking at the time, and so you'd have all this smoke and lantern slides and whatever. And in that group, <clears throat> a 1968 fellows, was Harold Varmus, Mike Brown, and Bob Lefkowitz, all who would win the Nobel Prize some years later. And this is an incredible group of people to work with. And, uh, and so my role was to try to bring together the relevance of the science that was going on in the laboratory to the clinic, to what was really going on in people. And I started to see patients with unusual forms of insulin resistance. And it turns out that these patients were the human models of how this process of hormone binding actually was taking place. That we could then subsequently verify that this was relevant to the human condition rather than just a laboratory test tube uh, by using the models of the patients that I had actually been able to uh, bring into the system. And so it was a very uh, uh, important period in which we sort of brought these things together uh, of how hormones work. We had this concept of pro-insulin. This is a, a, a concept that had developed <coughs> uh, out of a paper that was published by Donald, uh, uh, Donald Steiner, who was one of our uh, very important uh, grantees, but also on our National Advisory Council later on, uh, who had uh, suggested that insulin was made by way of a precursor. This was heretofore unknown. And so we tried to reproduce this, thinking that this, we could show this in humans. And actually, I had a patient who worked in the laundry who turned out to be the model system for this major paper that we published known as high molecular weight insulin. Well, as it turned out, we verified for the first time that this was true in humans. The same thing had gone on with the hormone receptors. We were able to join the laboratory with the clinic by now having established a clinical program that could match to some extent, not, not quite with the same strength as the basic program, but it began to work in that direction. So there we were, and now we were sort of all established, uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it allowed a sort of ferment of people that you were going to work with later on. It, it, it created this sort of network of people this incredible group of people, which were known as the Yellow Berets, who were here uh, at the time, who, because all the medical schools wanted to send their most outstanding people to NIH because of the experience they were going to have, and otherwise they were going to be drafted. It, this was during this draft period of time. And so that was really a, a, a very critical period of time. And so at that point, uh, I sort of, with the help of Ed Rawl, who was the scientific director, and Jack Robbins, who was again the chief of the branch I was in. And what was the name of the branch you were in? It was the Clinical Endocrinology Branch. At that time, that was the name of it. Okay. And with their encouragement, uh, I sort of stayed on, and because. Uh, one didn't know from one year to the next. You know, I was in the public health service, so I could just continue in the public health service, even though I had finished my so-called military obligation. But this sort of <clears throat> kind of allowed me to sort of move into the next chapter of, of where uh, Ed Rawl then asked me to become the clinical director of the institute. And again, we were a very broad institute. We had the Arthritis Institute, which is now the Arthritis Institute, NIMS, as part of our institute at that time, a slightly different name than we have now. And so we had exposure to many different diseases and many different types of patients. 
which for me was a total comfort. I was always very comfortable in seeing patients in the clinic, very comfortable interacting with the fellows. Uh, and we developed a, I think, a kind of real rapport at that time uh, in terms of of uh, the sort of clinic, developing the clinical program, because the clinical center itself was maturing over that period of time. When I first came, the clinical center really didn't offer all of the support services and so forth that you would really like to have in a major hospital. And all that began to grow and to mature, and I always felt a very uh, important part of that because I was very comfortable in seeing patients in other institutes and sort of consulting and on patients and sort of involved in that evolution of what turned out to be the clinical center as we sort of see it today. One would think that would be difficult because here you had had sort of this intensive work in, in endocrinology and you were doing insulin. Um, it, conceivably, when, when you become clinical director, it could be almost anything. Um, and isn't that kind of a high bar to get over all the time with, with each new disease, each new challenge? I think the, the phenomenon that was going on, clinical research is hard. It's difficult. Laboratory research with the technology that was available would allow you to make more progress much quicker. So. That was a real incentive uh, because you could make progress quicker, even with the technology that was available. Clinical research took longer. So if you were trying to either develop a career or sort of get from here to there, so to speak, it was going to take much longer. Remember, a lot of the people were on these sort of two-year cycles, and they needed to get something substantial done over a shorter period of time. And I think that was part of the sort of reason that this kind of evolved in the way that it did. And clinical research, I think, became much more important uh, or available. The technology to do it became much more available a little bit later on. Who were you working with as you expanded clinical research at NIDDK and elsewhere? Uh, and, and, and clinical research. Mm -hmm. Well, we had collaborations with the NCI um, uh, uh, surgical service, and we were studying uh, islet cell tumors, Sam Wells, Murray Brennan, uh, people that became sort of legends in the surgical field. We, in fact, had a whole host of surgeons that came through the surgical branch uh, Steve Epstein, Le uh, I mean Steve uh, um, uh, uh, later uh, came uh, to uh, uh, the, the sur this whole group of surgeons who were very much a part of the um, uh, the research we were doing uh, because we were working on these endocrine tumors, and it has expanded to other programs within NIDK now there's a very important program going on thyroid research and uh, <clears throat> other kinds of uh, endocrine tumors. Um, uh, I, mean, I was, I was uh, Steve Rosenberg's group, Steve came as the sort of chief of surgery and uh, we all were able to work together. One of the absolute key people in bringing much of this together was John Dotman who was the head of radiology. And so we needed this bond to bring uh, the endocrine people and the surgical people and so forth together. But remember, in our institute, we had liver disease, we had kidney disease, we had all these things which, for me, were uh, perfectly normal or natural. And, you know, it turns out NIDDK is this institute with diabetes, digestive, but remember that, that uh, diabetes is a leading cause of kidney disease. Nutritional issues of obesity and so forth, all these things are very much interrelated. So for me, it was never really an issue of one area versus another. I, I thought they were all very, very important. And I'd learned this in the intramural program already. It was really part of the base that, that 
was created for me. And you were supporting other people's research in some respects by doing the, the clinical side of the work, is that right? Uh, we certainly had multiple collaborations. Uh, of course, the fellows that were involved in this, uh, you know, in, in those initial days when we first started, uh, Ron Kahn was a fellow, Jeffrey Flyer was a fellow, uh, 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 and they were working with us and many others in other areas of liver disease and so forth. So we all were collaborative, working with each other and supporting each other, but there were, in each of the fields, we were collaborating with the Neurology Institute, with, with other people in NIH. So the, the clinical center did offer a, a real opportunity for uh, this sort of collaborative uh, interaction to go on, and that was really very important at the time. This was another endocrine disease, and we were the first to show that the treatment of this, this is caused by pituitary tumor, it's an overgrowth syndrome, and we were the first to show the efficacy of radiation therapy in the treatment of this disease, and so it, then uh, studied various aspects of uh, growth hormone secretion, various aspects of the form of growth hormone. And uh, so that sort of got us into this whole other area that had to do with insulin-like growth factors that grew up both in the laboratory and then we were able to use this in the clinic to study a whole host of hypoglycemic disorders. This sort of opened up a new field for investigation, just like we had done earlier in the insulin receptor area, where we had patients who had developed antibodies to their insulin receptor, genetic abnormalities of their receptors, and sometimes it took a while before the technology was really available to, un to unravel all this, but you were seeing this from the very ground floor in the beginning. and so. It, the, over time, then these things began to uh, to become more clear in terms of how they uh, or how they actually operated. Yeah, the acromegaly work. Um, how, how did that present itself to you? Did you just say, "Oh, let, well, let's let's look into this and try r r um, radiology"? Or? Well, what we did, we collaborated with a group of radio, radiation therapists. Uh, we collaborated with radiology because that was important in terms of looking and determining the size of these, uh, of these tumors. And so and we collaborated uh, with several other individuals, laboratory medicine and so forth, uh, and we had some basic scientists working uh, in the laboratory on these growth factors. So there was a, it was a way to bring both the, the laboratory and the clinic together again. And it was just another disease. We, we actually, because I had this sort of endless interest in a variety of diseases, we were the first to develop a radioimmunoassay for vasopressin, the hormone that conserves water. So we just studied a whole group of patients with vasopressin abnormalities and we published some, some very important papers related to that. We worked with uh, Dr. Jay Siegmiller, who was one of the pioneers of uh, treatment of uric acid diseases like gout. And we saw these things happening in some of these patients. And so we interacted with a large number of people because of the nature of what we were doing and how we could collaborate. In other words, that's really what research is all about. It's not necessarily about what indiv one individual does, but how one can create a collaborative effort so that you have a lot of expertise focused on the same problem. And that's really uh, the way the clinical center uh, facilitates research in such an important way. You've got all these people who work in different areas, but when they come together, it is really uh, sort of a, a, a force that's much greater than any individual. Um, and it sounds like some of the initiatives you talked about just then are things that came out of sort of routine visits to the clinical center. 
um, observing people and, and sort of d deciding to go after some of those? A lot of it is that, <clears throat> and a lot of it is the fact that you have to establish certain types of research interests. And now physicians all over the country or nurse practitioners uh, can refer patients because they know that you have an interest in studying a certain disease. This is the way things go on for the most part now. But in, in, in the early days, we were dealing with descriptive things. We couldn't really advertise for them because we didn't know what we were advertising for. But we would see these very unusual problems. And this is how the program that we actually still are doing now evolved. We evolved a program of studying rare diseases, which gave us a particular opportunity to describe hormone action and these other things that I've mentioned before, but it also gave us a venue into taking on new technologies that would subsequently become available and how they could be applied to these clinical circumstances that we had created in the earlier period. And then I was ready to sort of, you know, maybe venture abroad by this time. We were, uh, we were, um, <clears throat> you know, had reached a kind of mature state here and thought, well, maybe that would be a good idea. How did that come about? Did, did um, somebody mention, hey, you might want to go look in, look in uh, Geneva for a few years? Or? Well, it, the Geneva, the idea of sort of going abroad, we now had two children, and um, Vivian and I had two uh, terrific children. We now also have three fantastic grandchildren, but at that time, um, everybody was sort of ready for a new venture. And it turns out that I knew a cell biologist in Geneva by the name of Lily Orchi, uh, who uh, had established a cell biology program in Geneva at the University of Geneva. And so I met with Lilio and told him I'd like to come for a year. And, and, he, and he said, well, you, you clinicians really don't know very much about this. I said, no, I know, but I want to learn. And he was very kind in letting me come to the lab. And there was a young a fellow in the lab who had been there for a couple of years, the only MD in the lab, and I named Jean-Louis Carpentier, and he said, I want to work with you. I said, well, I don't know what I'm, what, anything about what I'm doing. He said, it doesn't matter. I want to work with you anyway. And so the idea we had was to try to understand from a morphologic, a visual point of view, what was happening when a hormone bound to a cell, the work that had been created already within the, uh, uh, the intramural program. This is and what Je Jesse Roth was looking at, right? Well, that's what Jesse Roth and Ira Paston and, and Bob Lefkowitz had done. So we wanted to see if we could actually visualize what they had done was actually in a test tube. What would happen if we could visualize? Would we develop any new concept? Well, after a while, we actually were able to establish a visual uh, image of a hormone binding to a cell. And we observed the fact that the hormone was actually taken up by the cell by a process called endocytosis, which means the hormone is being internalized by the cell. And this actually explained a phenomenon that we had developed before in the, in the uh, laboratory, that is a so-called down regulation. Hormone receptors could be regulated up and down and this explained how this process could go on by this process of endocytosis. It also explained how you could internalize the hormone and degrade it so that you could shut off the signal. And so this really became a, a, a very important nuance. And the other interesting part of it was is we were trying to develop the technology. This was sort of difficult because it was different from what Orchie and the group had worked on before in terms of what we had to do. Well, it turns out that our former fellows, Mike Brown and Joe Goldstein, who uh, were in Dallas, were working on a process similar to this with their low-density lipoprotein. And so I contacted them and said, well, would you fix some cells in a particular way and send them to us? And they said, okay. 
and they did, and we reproduced with our system what they had done with their system. And then I had a former uh, professor, uh, our assistant professor at Vanderbilt named Stanley Cohen, and uh, he was working with something called epidermal growth factor, which turns out to be an extremely important uh, growth factor now. A number of cancer drugs have been developed related to that and so forth. But so, and he finally, he agreed that he would send us some samples. And so now we were able to confirm what we were actually doing in, uh, in Geneva uh, by these networking sorts of things with these two different investigators. And so then I had the idea, so, well, why don't we put all this together? And I found that they totally balked at this. And I couldn't understand why they balked at doing this collaborative research since we'd worked with them. Well, I was too naive to understand that they were expecting to win the Nobel Prize, which happened in 1985. Brown and Goldstein won the Nobel Prize for LDL research, and in 1986, Stanley Cohn won the Nobel Prize for <clears throat> epidermal growth factor research. And they were a little bit concerned about collaborating with each other. I realized that only later, but it was a very nice. They have this wonderful paper and published uh, uh, just before they won the prize after I finally got them together. So it was part of my persuasion technology. I'd learned, you know, how to persuade some of these people to do some of the things that we needed to do, and I was successful at that point. By the time they'd done the paper, they probably figured things were going to work it out. It was okay then. by that time. It, I think it had gone far enough that it was okay. So we can now image things at a much finer resolution. Uh, and so we could actually label a hormone uh, and study it by what we use to call autoradiography, which was making an image of where the radioactive material was going. And we worked out techniques that we could show that it was either on the cell surface or it was in some sort of internal organelle or, or whatever. And the other investigators who I was just had had worked out similar kinds of things for other hormones, and this is how we were trying to put all this together to make it work for the system that we were working with. We did it basically with insulin, uh, and that was the initial studies, and this really gave us a lot of information about how insulin works. So we had the good fortune of having Ron Kahn still here at the NIH who could send us samples that we were uh, studying under the microscope where he could do the kind of experiments that they were doing at, at the NIH lab and we could work back and forth. And this is something that fortunately we've been able to continue over the years, uh, you know. In fact, <clears throat> I have sort of three deans to my credit. Uh, when I say credit, I, I never thought I was really a mentor because these people were all so incredibly capable it was just a very light touch but uh, but it turns out that Alan Spiegel who was a fellow and I had a chance to then appoint him scientific director later on uh, uh, became the Dean at Albert Einstein and uh, uh, John Louis Carpentier, who was a fellow that worked with me in Geneva became the Dean of the faculty based on the work that we had done. This is what propelled his career. And Jeffrey Flyer, who we were working as a fellow, became the dean of Harvard Medical School. So I, I perhaps not uh, appropriately, but take credit for the careers of three, three deans uh, uh, at that point. So uh, that was also, that's also very special. So we we uh, actually, because of the success of this work, and it turned out to be completely novel, we were writing papers as fast as we could, we were giving talks everywhere. I ended up staying a second year, which was very unusual at the time, uh, to spend, it was something like a sabbatical year, but to spend two years was unusual. Uh, so we spent the two years, it was fantastic, and so then I came back in 
we had to move Jeffrey Flyer out of our house, who had been living in our house while we were away. So it was just, we were networking in every possible way uh, of both living and working and so forth uh, together. And so I came back as clinical director, and so I was clinical director again, again doing many of the same kinds of things that, uh, that I had uh, done before. Had things changed over the last two years as far as the capabilities or the demands on the clinical director? Well, I think now this new building, uh, the glass box that's in the center now had been erected. And so the clinical center was clearly expanding. The clinical research was clearly uh, uh, expanding at the clinical center. And the facilities for doing clinical research clearly had begun to expand. So it was much more opportunity now to, to do clinical research uh, than had been in, in the previous times. Of course, a lot of this depends on the development of technology. And a clinical center is in a very unique position to assemble technology, and perhaps more important than that, assemble the individuals who can use that technology. That's really the bottom line of all of this, is assembling the two things having the resource and having the people. Did you make decisions as far as who to bring in uh, to, to work in the clinical area? Uh, not so much make decisions. I, in, in NIDDK, much of that is done by the scientific director, or done by sort of a process of having, you know, either clinical associates or medical staff fellows, whatever term we were using at the time but really sort of managing the clinical program in terms of its safety, uh, but in terms of also the, the kinds of imaginative or nuanced things that it was involved in. The, the clinical director is more at that level than they are at sort of formulating policy or, or those kinds of things, which goes on in this institute much more at the level of the scientific director always involved in some sort of way, but not directly involved. Were you involved with the clinical directors from other institutes? Yes, you met on a, on a regular basis, uh, and this established clinical center policy. A lot of it was aimed at uh, safety, a lot of it was aimed at technical development, a lot of it was aimed at what do we need, uh, to make this a better place and so forth. So you met with all the clinical directors on a very regular, on a very regular basis. Was this a, a pretty heavy administrative lift? Were you getting to the point where you were doing administrative work as much as science somewhere? Well, in there? it is to some extent, uh, but it, it sort of blends. I think that, that somehow the clinical center or the clinical research in the intramural program uh, has a certain kind of uh, 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 phenomenology that allows you to interact. I mean, in fact, things are very close to each other. You know, a lot of it has to do with how far away you have to go to, you know, to be in the lab or the clinic or some administrative function. Well, in the clinical center, again, it's one of the beauties of the clinical center. Many of these things are rather close to each other. So yes, they're administrative responsibilities, but they're not overwhelming, and uh, I think it doesn't really keep you away from participating in, in, in the scientific program. Are, is, are there any things that we should talk about in the clinical or scientific area before we move to the, the directorship discussion? I think that, uh, that the main thing is the sort of growth of the clinical center of which I always tried to play a, a major role because I, I felt the clinical center was a national institution and it was really something that was going to help in so many ways. And the idea of, to some extent, partially leaving it was a difficult thing to do. And we sort of get to the next chapter where I sort of move uh, not too far down the street, but just sort of down the street a little bit, but was in an entirely new kind of experience as uh, director of NIDDK. 
Um, and Jim Weingarten, who was the director of NIH at the time, uh, uh, 1986, uh, uh, asked me to take on that responsibility, and uh, I was a little bit reluctant to leave the intramural program because I, you know, had grown up in it and I really felt a part of it. But I felt that, well, maybe I can make some new contribution and would be a bit of a new turn, new twist on things. And so this is, again, a new learning experience. I think all these things, <clears throat> or at least for me, have been new learning experiences, and that's what's really exciting about them because they're all new. The directorship's an entirely different kind of thing. And you realize you have a responsibility to a much larger community, uh, this whole extramural community as well as the intramural community. And you realize that uh, either good times or bad times, you have the same responsibility to sustain this incredible program which is going on and you realize that one of the key issues that sustains that program is budget. We have such incredible talent seeking resources to do such important things and everyone is looking to the institute to support that. And unfortunately, we had some times where our budget literally was negative. Negative in the sense of so-called constant dollars, in other words, when you corrected the budget growth that we were getting uh, for inflation, the budget actually went negative, and that translated into what was happening to all of our investigators. Was this the case early on? Uh, for example, when you came in, was there, uh, did Jim Weingarten ha want to have a policy change? Did he want to have a strategic change? What was going on at that point? Well, I think that, that there was always an attempt to maintain the institutes at some sort of constant growth. That didn't always happen. Some institutes got a greater appropriation, but this all really had to do with your relationship with the Congress, because now all the institutes, remember, are autonomous, and the budgets, the appropriations, go to institutes. NIH, for, the, for all practical purposes, doesn't have an appropriation. I mean, it does to some extent, but majority of the budget goes to each institute. And we actually were the fifth largest of the institutes uh, in terms of budget. And so that is a very significant thing. Um, and we struggle with that. And we struggle with trying to maintain all of these interest groups. We have over 50 interest groups that you know are supporting what they believe in, what they're supporting the disease that that they support, and sometimes you, they all want to work together, and of course your job is to try to keep them working together as a whole, but individuals obviously are greater, uh, <clears throat> greater uh, proponents of their own interests than they are necessarily for the whole, and that's one of the jobs of the institute director is to try to maintain some kind of balance. And for an institute like NIDDK, that is a little bit more of an issue because we're divided into diabetes, digestive, and kidney diseases, and all these areas. And it's very important that we maintain the strength of all these components. I mean, ideally what you want to do is support the very best science that's out there. That's how the whole NIH peer review system is set up. And so you have that system to guide you, but it doesn't necessarily uh, uh, solve the issue of how all the individual groups feel that they have a need. So everyone has a need. 
the drive is going towards uh, the very best science that you can do, but you have to create some kind of a blend to make this work. And this is, I think, one of the, probably one of the most important challenges that an institute director has. First of all, acquiring the resources and then uh, figuring out some really uh, equitable way for those resources to be distributed, always keeping in mind that the quality of science is what's really important, but also remembering that each of these components really has to be sustained and is very important as to how they come together. And that's, I think, really part of the challenge of the whole thing. And in NIDDK, we have some fantastic people. So one of the enormous resources we have is the quality of the people we have, both not only the scientists in the intramural program, but all of the people who work on grants, who really administer grants, who really help maintain this whole community that we've developed through thick and thin, it's really up to the staff of the Institute to sustain them particularly through difficult times. When everything's really great, it's not so difficult, but that's not always the case. Now, fortunately, I was able to participate in the doubling of the NIH budget, which is something that came on <clears throat> uh, sometimes later, and that, of course, was just a great boom for NIH. It, it really, I think, represented the quality that NIH brought to the nation. Because you don't just double a budget without really having something to show for it. And I think that was the appreciation. And one of the things that NIH has always been is bipartisan. So it's, it's always really never gotten caught, I think, not totally, but in this somewhat vicious partisan divide that can happen because both sides of the aisle, I think, have supported biomedical research because it's obviously in the human and the common interest. Now, there are certain tangential areas that become more controversial, but, but that's not the biggest picture that goes on. The big picture is very bipartisan and very supportive. You would have come in as director in the Reagan administration, right? Yes. And so that's a period where there's t talk about fiscal discipline and keeping budgets low and things like that. Um, so were you seeing sort of a, a tendency to want to keep the lid on things during yeah. those first years? Yeah, that, that was uh, the point that made it so difficult because, you see, <clears throat> those are also uh, high inflation years. And when you correct for that, which is always, and biomedical inflation is much greater than the, than the standard inflation uh, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the gross domestic product inflation factors, uh, biomedical inflation is usually double that. And so you had a, a, a much greater issue to deal with at that time. Uh, and this is, I think, again, one of the real challenges is of getting your community through this because there is another side, and the other side is when the NIH budget doubled. It, it's almost like crossing the Jordan River or something. You know, there's another side. I, I wish I could sing gospel songs or something. Maybe I could have been more effective, but... Uh, but that's really, in some ways, what you're doing. You're, you're so do you have meetings and tell people, hey, this is what we had to do this year, but there's always next year, and this, you know, we're looking at these plans going out. How, how did you keep people moving along with you in the, that period? Well, I think that it's very difficult to explain to someone why you're reducing their grant by 15%. And now next year, you come back and explain to them you're reducing it by 20%. And well, what are you doing that for? Well, you're doing that because when your budget goes, remember NIH grants are given for several years. 
and the out year costs have to deal with an individual appropriation year. And so if the appropriation year doesn't account for what you spent the first year, the only thing you can do is reduce it. So the first thing you try to do is get people to understand that process and understand that you're going to do everything possible to reverse that, to make that. And you're going to do everything you can to help bridge them from one place to another. And so there were so many people that really were so grateful for what you can do individually to help bridge them from <clears throat> one difficult spot to the next. Because, again, there's always this upside that we are looking forward to, and fortunately we have examples of this upside. So when you can point to these, it's helpful. It, it's, it's, there's no magic way to deal with a downsized economy. I mean, it's true, not just at NIH, but everywhere, but it's, it's one of the real factors. I found this kind of natural. I was a bit apprehensive about this kind of things as all of a sudden now you're going up to a major congressional committee. When I first started, we were testifying for two hours in the House and for at least uh, an hour individually in the Senate. Uh, but I actually became very comfortable with that because I thought I really was representing something that was important. They seemed to have an interest in it, and uh, it actually seemed to, uh, to go uh, quite well. So some of the things that you think might not be as pleasurable, particularly in this job, now you, you do have to, to kind of be very well prepared. So this is one of the things that I was accustomed to. I had some terrific people who would help me uh, uh, prepare for congressional hearings. We work very hard to portray the very best of NIDDK and the very best of NIH uh, because that's really a key part of what an institute director essentially has to do. Uh, and as I say, when the budgets work, everything else seems to work much better. Right? And when they don't work, it creates a much bigger sort of struggle to kind of sustain from one point to the next. And the only way, you, as I say, that you really do this is just to know that there is another side of the river. It's going to get better. And, and it, it's not all that different from talking to a patient about an illness. You've got to try to convey an understanding, and you've got to try to convey some sort of uh, feeling <clears throat> uh, when things are either good or bad, no matter what they are, you have to be able to convey a certain confidence to the individual. And in some ways, my experience with doing that and interacting with patients, something that I'd done all my life and something that I really felt very uh, comfortable in doing, really was the model for me of what I was doing when I was testifying to the Congress and so forth, because it's really all part and parcel of the same thing. Any memorable occasions when you, when you were speaking to Congress about things at NIH? Well, I mean, I had a few, you know, sort of ruts in the road occasionally, but most of the time it, it went, you know, fairly well. As time went on, the Congress, the committees spent less time uh, with the individual appropriations. We, we had, uh, uh, you know, a number of celebrities. For instance, uh, I would testify with Mary Tyler Moore, uh, who we also had uh, uh, <clears throat> this major group, the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation, which she was uh, representing. Uh, Woody Johnson, who's now the U.S. Ambassador to England, was part of this uh, whole thing. Uh, we had a number of other sort of celebrity types, and we would testify, and, and also there were also hearings 
special hearings that weren't appropriations hear hearings that we uh, participated in. Uh, 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 our senator from Maine uh, had brought a group of children in and she would ask the, the institute directors to come in and talk about diabetes and what they're doing for diabetes and these were children with juvenile. This is something that the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation had had sponsored and had gotten uh, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, approval and permission to do. And so you always ended up with uh, certain other types of celebrity types who were doing this. This is sort of the way congressional hearings and so forth frequently go in that particular direction uh, to sort of influence on the moment. Now one of the <coughs> The issues always <clears throat> was so-called earmarking, where uh, individual groups would really press the Congress for appropriations, and the Congress decided they didn't want to deal with that, and so they wanted NIH to deal with that. So now, in the latter part of the time I was director, much of this sort of earmarking phenomenon that the Congress had assumed before, now was transferred to the NIH. So now you had even more pressure. And in our institute, as I say, we have over 50 uh, individual groups who, uh, who uh, <clears throat> you know, were, are all for the institute. Our goal was to try to keep them as positive as we could as a collective group because uh, we thought they could have a much greater influence than if everybody went off on their own. But that can only work up to a certain point, and so you have to, you know, you have to accept both sides of that. You've talked a, a lot about the situation you were in where you have to tell people that there are going to be better days. At, at some point, there are. Tell me about that. What was going on that, that brought about the, the increase in budget at NIH? And, how did you respond? Did you have a party? <laughs> well, you know, <clears throat> it depends to some extent. I think in many ways the, the two people that were probably res the most responsible for that phenomenon was the director of NIH, who happened to be Harold Varmus at the time, and John Porter, who was chairman of the House Appropriations Committee. Because remember, all appropriations bills starts in the House, and frequently that's uh, one of the most important uh, per people, the House, the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, and so uh, and, and so, I think it was really John Porter and Harold Varmus who probably played the pivotal role in developing that. That now. We also had a lot of other, I go back to, uh, to uh, uh, Warren Grant Magnuson. I have actually, he was a patient of mine at one point. Uh, and uh, Mark Hatfield. I mean, all these people were very important in terms of the growth of the, the uh, NIH. They were all interested in the NIH. And uh, I think that, you know, whether they happened to sit on one side of the aisle or the other, was not the critical uh, issue. The issue was the institution. And I think that's really one of its really strong points. I think that as clinical trials had evolved in hypertension, in lipid metabolism, where we now had drugs and we now were making major impact in control of some of the most important chronic diseases. It hadn't happened in diabetes. The Diabetes Control and Complication Trial was the pivotal primary trial that showed <clears throat> that even small changes in the average blood glucose could cause a major improvement, could lead to a major improvement in outcome in type 1 diabetics. And, and that was really the key. And then we were able to get into pre diabetes prevention program to try to add another uh, uh, step. We tried, and that was in type 2 diabetes, a very successful program that's still going on. 
We tried it in type 1 diabetes to prevent it. That was not so successful. We've tried it in obesity, the so-called look-ahead program. The, the, the important thing is, is that actually uh, the clinical trials program really became very mature in our institute for the first time because major clinical trials had really not been undertaken. Uh, they had been small in certain ways, but not to this magnitude. And they were coming up in each of our divisions. We had uh, attempts to control blood pressure to affect renal disease. We had the trials to, for nutritional issues to try to control obesity. We had now a set of centers that we knew centers that were being introduced to try to bridge areas that didn't have quite as strong a research uh, background as others. Sometimes the center is a way to bridge that gap. It creates a sort of a, um, a, of a program. It creates a funding stream. It allows an institution now to try to bring together uh, an important research effort. And so in areas where the research is actually very weak, this is just as much a responsibility that an institute has. You've got to somehow not just take those individuals who are excelling and whose grants and, and whose programs are going to go, but try to find ways to augment those programs that are not because the issues that affect the public are the same for those diseases in which progress is not as great as in those diseases where progress is much greater. So that's all part and parcel of the same thing. And you have to use different mechanisms. We established a clinical nutrition uh, research centers to try to bolster nutrition research. And in fact, there were certain discoveries that took place one that we can mention <clears throat> uh, later, uh, discovery of leptin, for instance, is something that, uh, that has played a very important part intramurally, but that also had a huge effect on funding in nutrition research because it all of a sudden created a whole new neurobiology research program that we didn't have before. And so all these things kind of interact, as I say, they all become part and parcel of the growth of the Institute. And you have to try and find a way to extend those things. And once you see a good example, uh, you've got to try to find a way to extend it. And that's really part of what the challenge is all about, um, it is trying to make it a broad-based rather than a very narrowly focused uh, issue. So the centers and these big clinical trials are a way to do that? Yes. I think the centers and the big clinical trials are something that can be inaugurated only by the Institute. And it's very different from the so-called investigator-initiated research. It's not that you don't have advice from many people as to how to do these large programs. You do. But it's not the same as the classic NIH peer review program where an individual investigator is applying for a grant. This is a much more focused kind of thing. This has got to be an institute uh, effort that's coming from the institute, from the staff of the institute, with all the advice that you can possibly bring to bear. You obviously want to get everything you can that's going to be positive about that uh, to, to bring to bear on the issue. There were so many things that, you know, we went through, as I say, funding good times and, and bad times. I think that just the uh, working with the people that I had chance to work with in the, interim, in the extramural staff program to learn uh, much more about the extramural program to get uh, much closer in a whole variety of areas. 
you know, as diverse as urology. So you have diabetes, and you have urology, you have digestive diseases. You know, I began to interact and learn more about all these areas, which I felt, again, because of the background that I had had, this sort of broad background in, in clinical medicine, I felt very comfortable in these areas. But now you're really exposed, and it was a whole, as I say, a whole new learning experience. Again, the congressional interaction, the NIH interaction, I mean, you're sort of interacting with uh, a pretty high-powered group of people uh, just within the NIH community itself. To some extent, you're competing a little bit. Uh, you know, I think more we work together than we compete, but there's always a little bit of both. And it, it, there's always, uh, you know, certain kinds of friction that <clears throat> that come up with these sorts of things. Everyone would like to, uh, <clears throat> you know, to be more of the uh, recipient than the donor, and which is what frequently these things come down to because there's always a, a, a pressure for institutes to co-fund or to fund certain kinds of things. And these pressures are coming from multiple places. They may come from the Congress, they may come from the NIH director, they may come from, <clears throat> you know, other sort of sources, and you just sort of have to deal with all these different areas that, uh, uh, as they come up. First of all, uh, I've done this for 13 years now, and um, I think a kind of uh, sort of new revival or freshness is always a good thing uh, for an institute. Uh, so I felt that, <clears throat> that uh, you know, we had a, by this time a billion dollar budget, that we had done pretty well in the budget areas. We had a very mature clinical research program. Uh, the basic research was going well, and <clears throat> my actual home was the intramural program from the very beginning. So <clears throat> here was a chance to sort of go back and sort of see what could happen. And we had the good fortune of a discovery that had just been made through an extramural grant to Jeff Friedman of this hormone called leptin. And we then were, uh, with some intramural collaborators, able to put together a whole program of research using these model systems that we had developed back in the very early days. We studied these rare diseases like lipodystrophy, insulin receptor mutations, genetic disease. This is what we had created and studied from the beginning. Now we had an opportunity to take the, the next step, that is the treatment of these diseases. We had described them, we had recognized them, but we didn't treat them. Now we could do it. And so leptin then became a mainstay in the treatment of lipodystrophy. We actually were able to get it approved in the United States for a generalized form of lipodystrophy, and it's now been approved in Japan and in a common Europe for all forms of lipodystrophy. And we've now been able to establish a organized <clears throat> a treatment program for one of these other autoantibody syndromes that has to do with severe insulin resistance, and we're working on how to treat patients with these genetic forms. It's a little bit more difficult uh, a new investigator, Rebecca Brown, who's worked with me over the last several years, is taking a major leadership role in developing therapeutic programs and, and for those particular entities. And so that's really <clears throat> kind of what the enormous opportunity has been. And so much of it depends on the opportunity that you have. and. So in my case, I was just very fortunate, have been extremely fortunate in all these 
things that I've been able to do within the NIH community, both spend time in Europe, in the intramural program, the extramural program, and so forth. So it's been quite a, uh, uh, an experience. I have two sons uh, <clears throat> who, um, one's a professor of surgery at Vanderbilt in the liver transplant program, which interacts with the NIH, another who's uh, an interventional pulmonologist in Seattle uh, and a center director. So we have kind of an, a daughter-in-law, actually, who's an internist. So we have our regular, our own HMO, so we can kind of continue this medical venture even both within the NIH and, and outside of the NIH. So it's been really a total pleasure over all these years. And we're back here in the clinical center, so you're clearly somewhere that's comfortable. Back home, exactly.